So it's my great privilege today uh, to, uh, to introduce Dr. Peterson. But even before I introduce Dr. Peterson, first I have to tell you a little bit about this new seminar series that we are kicking off. Uh, this is our inaugural seminar of the ECE Distinguished Seminar Series that was just started uh, this year. Uh, and um, we are, we're trying to use this as a vehicle to bring some of the uh, most accomplished uh, uh, scientists and technologists in the world uh, to our uh, uh, student audience. And uh, we could have really no better person uh, to kick off this series than Dr. Kurt Peterson. Uh, those of us uh, who are in the MEMS field, and I know there are many in this audience who are in the MEMS field, uh, are all familiar uh, with, with his landmark paper, which is now probably close to 50, 45 years old, actually, I should say. Um, uh, and uh, uh, silicon as a uh, mechanical material, but he has also uh, been very, very successful in taking MEMS technology to industry uh, uh, to a unique uh, uh, extent, unmatched by anybody. He's, he's had five successful companies, uh, including uh, Cepheid, uh, and, which was acquired by Danaher in 2016, and Cytime, which was acquired by Megachips in 2014. In 2001, his uh, MEMS contributions were acknowledged by the IEEE Simon Ramo Medal. And this year, in fact, he is the IEEE uh, Medal of Honor uh, winner, which is the highest award uh, given by IEEE. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Peterson to take over. Thank you much, uh, Yogesh. I really appreciate the introduction. So I'm going to have to apologize already. We start right off. Um, I changed this to 60 years from 45 years because I found a couple of companies that I had forgotten about that are even older than 45 years. So I, to make an introduction, it's, it's actually pretty intimidating to be giving a talk on MEMS at the University of Michigan. I mean, Ken Weiss, uh, where's Ken? There, Ken, Ken was, was my hero when I was a graduate student and when I was first getting into the MEMS area. And the University of Michigan is probably one of the top three universities in the world, you know, doing MEMS and have accomplished a tremendous amount in MEMS. So it's, again, it's a little bit intimidating to give a MEMS talk here. It's like bringing coals to Newcastle. But uh, I'm going to maybe talk about a slightly different perspective and startup companies, because my most of my career was spent uh, in startup companies. The first one was in 1982, which was a total failure, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So I've had kind of the experience of failures and successes, and I've just had a great fun doing MEMS startup companies. So what really is driving the MEMS uh, industry is this graph here. So this goes back to 1975. Um, and it's the integrated shipments of uh, integrated circuit products, semiconductor components in blue, and MEMS components in red. And the ratio uh, of MEMS to, uh, to semiconductors uh, shown over the, over the years. So, and you can see the introduction of different products. This is the manifold absolute pressure sensor for automotive, disposable blood pressure sensor for medical, inkjet, and on, on, up here, up into MEMS oscillators. So the MEMS industry, when I started working on it, and when the rest of us here started, was like 1% of the semiconductor industry, 1.5%. You know, today, it's getting up to 3.5%, or approaching 4%. So it's a really getting to be a substantial, substantial market. And a lot of this growth has only happened within the last 10 years or so. In fact, um, People first started talking about, oh, I've cumulatively shipped a billion MEMS chips. That really only happened in 2009, so only about 10 years ago. Now there's billions and billions of chips sold every year. So this economic driver is you know, what's really one of the interesting things about MEMS. And what's the, been the fuel for this driver is the different products and the different uh, variety of products which have come out. Early on, this was the pressure sensor early on, fairly early on, inkjet. 
gas chromatograph, the digital light projector, which is probably the projector that's in this, uh, projecting this image, atomic force microscope, F-bar, filter, inertial devices, microphones, oscillators, a variable capacitor arrays. So we've come from kind of very crude beginnings, mostly pressure sensors, to a vast variety of products. And I'm going to sort of concentrate on sort of historically how a lot of this happened over the last years. One of the first startup companies was a company called Coolite, started in 1959, um, building pressure sensors. Um, then some of the big companies got involved, Delco, Toyota, Motorola, um, National Semiconductor, Foxborough, um, and other companies dabbling in other areas. There was a thermal print head developed by Texas Instruments in 73, Hewlett Packard, a thermal voltage converter. And then some of the more recent startups happened, IC sensors and Sensim, a microsensors technology, which we'll talk more about, a, a gas chromatograph company, and transsensory devices, which was my first startup company. Um, the gas chromatograph, um, again, just sort of going historically here, the R&D started in the late 70s by Professor Jim Angel at Stanford. And this was a 1983 cover of Scientific American showing the gas chromatograph on a silicon wafer. Um, and the company Microsensor was founded in 91 or 81. And today, a large fraction of today's gas chromatographs use technologies that was sort of came out of Microsensor. And, um, there's a sort of a version, a current version, a more current version. Um, but in recent decades, Professor Gia Chandani, Professor Zellers, and others at Michigan have been the leaders in cutting edge technology for integrated MEMS uh, chromatographs. And I was just talking with Yogesh today, and I found this picture. I'm not sure if this picture is a is a, uh, is a real one from uh, his company, uh, Omnisent. But this is kind of what this technology has transitioned to, these very complex MEMS gas chromatographs. So I wrote this paper um, in 1982, Silicon as a Mechanical Material. And I think this was kind of one of the papers that kind of got a people who were doing a lot of different MEMS things sort of got them thinking in the same direction about building mechanical, micro-mechanical structures on silicon. Uh, my first startup was TDI in 1982. We built some exciting devices. This is a mass flow sensor. This is about 200 microns across here. There's a platinum resistor that's on this flow sensor, and it measures the flow of gases in this channel that's formed with this etching here. We also built a force sensor that we used to calibrate wire bonders. So you would press your wire bonder down on the top here, it would measure the force over time, and you could calibrate your wire bonder. Um, so TDI became the company for advanced MEMS development. So people would come to us with different MEMS projects, and we would try to build chips for them. But nothing transitioned into a device into high volume production. You know, again, MEMS in those days was very naive and very immature and a very small industry. Um, so I left TDI in 1985 and founded, uh, co founded a company called Nova Sensor with uh, Janusz Bryzek and Joe Mallon. And this is a picture of us in 1985. So when I didn't have any gray hair and um, uh, and this is one of our pressure sensor chips in the background. So Nova Sensor was a great adventure. Um, all the mistakes that we'd made at TDI, you know, not focusing on products, not focusing on production, not focusing on quality control, all those changed with Nova Sensor. Um, we were funded by the Oil Exploration Schlumberger, which is interesting because Khalil is a professor of the Schlumberger. <laughs> so um, very, a company that's very uh, looking forward in terms of technology. Um, our first products were disposable medical pressure sensors. So actually during the time while I was at Nova Sensor, we were shipping lots of disposable blood pressure sensors that would go in your catheter that was coming off your arm when you have an operation. And actually my father during this time had an operation, had heart surgery, and he had our pressure sensor on his, uh, on his catheter, so that was kind of exciting. Um, but we also started doing the first applications with silicon fusion bonding, where you bond two wafers together to form 
complex mechanical parts. Um, there was a talk at IBM in San Francisco at the IEDM meeting one year that I went to, and I went to the author of the paper, and I said, when you build these transistors, you know, how do you know that bond is good? Don't the transistors fall off the chip you know, sometime or something? He said, no, 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 they're very stable. So all of a sudden, we had this vision, hey, we could build mechanical devices and MEMS devices using silicon fusion bonding. I'll talk more about that later. So Nova Sensor ultimately uh, was sold to Lucas Technologies in 1991, and I stayed there another five years after that. So at Nova Sensor, again, exciting chips that we developed. Um, these, this one here and this one here are catheter tip pressure sensors that were the smallest pressure sensors at the time. Um, this is an accelerometer, one of the first accelerometers for airbag deployment uh, was sold to Honda. Um, this is a thermal voltage converter. Uh, this is a chip using silicon fusion bonding where this top diaphragm of the pressure sensor is bonded onto the bottom wafer. And this is a just sort of a demo part demonstrating the first DRIE and fusion bonding type of technology. And today, Almost every MEMS device that's in commercial production is a combination of silicon fusion bonding and this deep reactive ion etching. But this is the first time that people had made structures with this very high aspect ratio. Um, so just, again, going forward a little bit more in history, the next big thing that happened was inkjet nozzles. So um, the largest volume MEMS component now shipping is inkjet nozzles array. They, they slowed down a little bit in recent years, but for many years, it was the highest volume MEMS product that was made. Um, some of the earliest work and a lot of the production was IBM, HP, and Canon. And basically, you machine this little hole in various materials, and you have this fluidic structure underneath with, with heaters, which uh, make a little when you turn on the heater, it makes a little uh, air bubble, which pumps out this droplet. And again, this technology is very mature now. You just take it for granted at this time. The ejection mechanism is, is thermal. But the, again, the volumes are, are huge. One and a half billion cartridges uh, are manufactured every year. This is probably maybe a five-year-old data, but huge volumes. Um, and also during that time, there was just a huge amount of research, you know, MIT, Michigan, Berkeley, Stanford, on uh, release structures on silicon. So this was a Bell Labs picture of a gear train. So this is about a 200 micron diameter gear. And this, when you turn this gear with a little compressed air burst, it would move the other gears. And this was the smallest mechanical structure that was built at that time. That transitioned into a project at UC Berkeley in 1988 where they built the first MEMS micro motor. So here's a 10 micron bar. So this is about 100 microns across. And they could actually spin this motor. All these components are made out of polycrystalline silicon. And shortly after this, this transitioned into the comb drive, uh, also at UC Berkeley in 1989. Comb drive, and even today, the comb drive is one of the most important developments in MEMS. It's a capacitive sensing of the motion of those fingers. You're measuring the change in capacitance. That's measuring the change in motion. It's used in actuators. It's used in uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes. It's just like a universal technology. And in these days, it was made in polysilicon, which could only be a couple of microns thick. Today, these structures are being made with deep reactive ion etching and fusion bonding, and so they can be you know, even hundreds of microns of thick. So it's an interesting combination of technologies, the comb drive and the DRIE, which is transition things. But even the polysilicon was uh, started uh, the first commercial accelerometer by analog devices in 1995 pioneer in, in MEMS devices. They still make a lot of accelerometers. Um, but this device, it was the thin polysilicon. It had problems. You know, it's, it's so thin that the movable element has not too much mass. So it's kind of, so in an acceleration field, it's not moving too much because the mass is so light. Um, but that changed with fusion bonding. Now you can make them very thick and still get the, the kind of motion, but now it's much higher mass. 
Also, packaging was a problem, but I won't get into that. Um, so the first DRIE SF silicon fusion bonding paper was in 1995. You can see this very poor print. That was that's because this was 25 year old, you know, conference proceedings technology. So, um, but this was really took off this silicon fusion bonding and DRIE. And I have to say that we should uh, really thank a guy named Franz Larimer. Who, uh, who was an employee at Robert Bosch at the time, and he was, had the vision of inventing this, um, this DRIE technology. Uh, and this has just been, a, again, a huge boost to the, uh, to the MEMS field. Also, you know, again, during this roughly the same time was when the first digital light projectors came out. Um, a very famous MEMS guy, Larry Hornbeck, started this project in 1976. And TI management over the 20 year period kept killing the project. You know, every two years they would kill the project. He would have to revive the project and it was killed and killed and killed so many times. But he managed to revive it. The first real product was in 1996. And today the modern, uh, uh, I think they have more than actually 2 million movable mirrors per chip right now. Um, this is, you can see how complicated the structure is. It's, this is the torsion spring, and you have electrostatic pull down of, the, of this torsion bar, and it moves the mirror, and the complex optical system extracts the image. It's just an incredibly complex and intricate mechanical structure. Of course, it can do grayscale and color. Um, and this was also probably the number two seller for many years, a billion dollar a year product. And today, um, you know, with a flat panel TV, you know, a lot of the, the market size in terms of number of chips has dropped for this product, but it's still used in your movie theaters and in devices like this projector that's on the ceiling here. So it's still a very big product. Uh, and there's still no competition. Um, and actually, one of the interesting uses of this, I find, for the semiconductor field is it's uh, now used in machines doing maskless lithography. So you can have this chip in there that, and you don't need a mask anymore. You know, you just have this a, a digital mirror display that's projecting the image on your chip and, um, and uh, doing your lithography for you. Again, going forward a little bit more, um, I found a company called Cepheid doing microfluidic diagnostics in 96. Um, Cepheid was uh, on NASDAQ for a number of years. It was, is one of Silicon Valley's 100 largest companies. Uh, a couple of years ago, its revenue was 640. Oh, that's, that, there's an extra zero there. Sorry, that's, it's 640 million a year, not 6.4 billion. Revenue growth of 20% per year. Uh, they had disposable microfluidic cartridges with reagents on board. And here's what the cartridge looked like. Uh, all injection molded plastic with injection molded uh, fluidics inside. This little diamond shaped chamber was a reaction chamber for the polymerase chain reaction, um, uh, reaction that took place. This is the processing module. So you would open this door, put the cartridge inside there and uh, it would extract the DNA from the sample. The sample could be blood, could be urine, it could be a swab. Uh, actually, the US Postal Service still today tests all your mail for anthrax with sepiod cartridges. So they deposit dirty water from a, a vacuum uh, into the cartridge and look for anthrax. Um, but the company took this basic processing module and put 50 of these in a robotic machine. And so the robot would pick up the cartridges, plug them into the processing module, do the process, get the results. It might take about a half hour. And then when it was done, it would take it out and put in another cartridge, all automatically loading and unloading all these cartridges. So every major uh, medical testing lab in the country has this machine today. Um, so the gene expert, we called this, uh, has 20, more than 20 FDA approved human tests. Um, the Cepheid uh, tuberculosis assay is rated by the World Health Organization as better than the current gold standard. So it's just an incredibly good chemistry as well as MEMS in it. And the company was acquired for Danaher in 2016 for $4 billion. 
This is a Cepheid founding team. Um, just so, so actually, in terms of startups, this was a key person for me. You know, when I started Cepheid, I'm an electrical engineer. What do I know about or diagnostics? So the first thing that I did was hire an experienced uh, uh, bi uh, biotech executive, Tom Gutschall. And uh, some of you may know Greg Kovacs. So Greg is now at SRI. Um, and here's the team one year later. Uh, again, this was in 1997. And um, this was the uh, uh, only company I've had that did an IPO. It was very exciting going on the road trip and speaking about the company four or five times a day to different investors. And this is uh, myself and Tom and our CFO pressing the button to send the S1 document to the SEC. So that was in 2000. Um, so again, going forward in history, the MEMS microphones. They were first introduced in 2002. They might have actually three or four microphones in it. Um, and here's a chip. It's just a diaphragm that's a capacitive sensing the acoustic signal. A MEMS chip plus a CMOS chip. And here's kind of a cartoon of the pack, a typical package. There's a number of manufacturers now. But the reason why this product took off, which is kind of interesting to me, is that people just had electrets as microphones in the early days of cell phones. You know, a piece of uh, plastic that was polarized. And when the plastic moved, the polarization charge changed. And that was the acoustic signal. But if you, if you go through a wave soldering machine, it's at high enough temperature that the, that the electret would depole. So then the microphone doesn't work anymore. So the microphone had to be attached with a separate manufacturing step at the end of the process. So, but the MEMS microphone allowed you to put the microphone chip on with all the other integrated circuit components, go through the wave soldering, and it just worked perfectly. It didn't depole or anything. So, for that very reason, the industry took off. And when it was introduced in 2002, the volume was 2 million units. Just a few years later, five years later, it was 500 million units. And it was, and of course, the quality got better. The size got better, it became cheaper, all those kind of things. This year, they're scheduled to ship 5.5 billion MEMS <laughs> microphones. Um, there's multiple microphones for phone, as I, for, per phone, as I mentioned. And so 1.3 billion revenues in 2019. And if you do this division here, let's go back. If you do this division, $1.3 billion divided by 5.5 billion units, you know, you're seeing that these devices, the price of them has come down so dramatically, you know, that it's even hard for some of these component manufacturers to make money because the part, the price per part that you sell is so inexpensive. And so engineers can be very, very, very good at improving performance and making the of smaller size uh, and reducing the cost. And that's kind of one of the negative things about these kind of products. The, the revenue is always going down, even though you're selling more parts. Um, the F-bar filter has been a huge uh, MEMS product. Um, for many years, they didn't want to call it a MEMS device because MEMS was sort of a four-letter word for quite a long period of time. And, uh, but it actually is a MEMS device. It's a little vibrating mechanical structure. Um, typically 100 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. It's a filter. This is a picture of it. It's a complicated structure that, that vibrates in the thickness mode. So this, all these blue areas are all um, mechanically isolated from the substrate. And it's a filter for, uh, for the various transmission and reception bands in the cell phone. Filters, duplexers, and multiplexers. Shipments began in 2002, 2003. This year alone, Avago by itself is going to ship 6 billion of these filters. So again, the numbers are just, they count them in how many units per second that they ship. So it's just been an enormously successful MEMS product. And that's one of the early packages. It's a critical component for today's multiband smartphones. Uh, and, and actually, this element is kind of interesting. The element that, that moves is a piezoelectric material, aluminum nitride, 
which has only you know, been a successful uh, MEMS material for about the last 15 years. So it's kind of a relatively newcomer to the MEMS field. Michigan Neuroprobe, and I, this has one of, been one of the more exciting products in the MEMS area. And I put 2004 here, and I'll show you why I put that date, because it was invented by Professor Ken Weiss in 1970. And uh, serious work really began at Michigan in 74 by Professor Wise and Professor Khalil Najafi. Um, and this is kind of just something I pulled off the web with an array of neural probes. It's, it's just been a wonderful product, a wonderful technology. But I put 2004 because their, comp their startup company, NeuroNexus, which makes these, was spun off in 2004. And today, these probes are really fundamental to neural research, to, uh, and, to, and the impact on neuroscience has been enormous. I mean, it's it allowed understanding of the interaction between nerve cells and brain cells, and it's just been, it's been a huge uh, boon to that area. And now there's a new generation of optically-based probes which are being developed at Michigan. So again, Michigan is really heading this whole field just, you know, way n number two is way far behind. And this is from uh, uh, a probe from uh, Yusik Yoon right here showing the micro LEDs now shining light into the tissue and monitoring the response of the nerve cells to the light. Again, going forward in history, uh, one of the most successful companies founded during this time was in Vincense, um for inertial devices. Um, they had the first commercialized consumer-oriented gyroscope, which was made by wafer bonding. So here's the CMOS wafer. They bonded a MEMS wafer to that. And here's the movable gyroscope element. And then the CMOS, of course, are in the CMOS wafer. Um, first single chip gyroscope and accelerometer. And the first products were for image stabilization in cameras. But then Nintendo became a big customer. And those things you hold for the Nintendo and you wave around and the, the paddle is moving on the screen and the ball is bouncing back and forth, that's uh, uh, InventSense chips that are measuring how you're rotating your arm, how you're moving your arm. And this is when the, the, this gyro first really took off. Then the cell phone market happened in 2008 and the field exploded. So today, I think every cell phone has a gyroscope in it just because it's sort of expected to have a gyroscope. And there are three major players, um, Robert Bosch, ST Micro, and InventSense. So obviously Robert Bosch and ST Micro are big, big companies, but InventSense being a startup in 2006, they're, it, they're always in the top three. So it's been a very successful MEMS company. In fact, they were just acquired by TDK a couple years ago for a billion dollars. And this is, I just like this chip because it just shows the complexity of MEMS. I mean, you normally look at a chip like this and your first reaction is, oh, this is an integrated circuit chip. But you actually don't see the CMOS here. This is all the MEMS components. It's just incredibly complicated. Three axis gyro, three axis accelerometer, very sophisticated chip. So this is a, another one of my companies, this um, SciTime, a MEMS oscillator. So I built some of the first MEMS oscillators in 1975. <laughs> and, and when they first came to me and said that they were going to build a MEMS oscillator uh, for replacing the quartz crystal, I said, oh, you're crazy. You know, you're not going to get the stability you required. But this was invented at Robert Bosch again. And this device is, just works incredibly well. So it's made with silicon fusion bonding. This is what the oscillator looks like. These mass, these uh, sections of the arm move back and forth capacitively. They're capacitively uh, electrostatically coupled back and forth and then measured how much they're moving. It's, um, it's a single point suspension suspended right here. So there's no stretching when the chip is distorted or anything like that. It's also in a very high quality vacuum chamber. For the first shipments happened in 2007. Um, the MEMS chip is coupled with a huge variety of different types of uh, CMOS signal conditioning chips for many timing applications. And here's kind of a typical implementation. Here's the MEMS oscillator on top, uh, on top of a CMOS chip, signal conditioning chip. And the oscillator is buried underneath the surface of the MEMS chip. 
Um, it's, today, these devices are better than quartz in every way. Um, frequency stability is in the parts per billion. And there's been over one and a half billion of these shipped to date. Um, there's an optional chip on board package, which is shown here. This is the CMOS chip uh, out here, this rectangular piece. The MEMS chip is flip chip bonded here. And now these flip chip bond pads are allow this whole chip to be uh, flipped over and bonded onto a PCB. So it's just uh, incredibly low cost. These sell for less than 20 cents. So it's a hugely competitive area. Um, I like to show this slide. This is the team. So uh, uh, Marcus and Aaron are the two guys from Bosch who invented this. Uh, Tom Kenny is, uh, is a professor at Stanford in the MEMAS area. And this is one of our planning sessions. And this is, uh, we used to hang out at my wife's restaurant, so I don't know why I decided to put this picture in, but this was one of our favorite meeting places, Ho Chow Restaurant. Um, slide time today. Again, we licensed this technology from Bosch. Um, it took 10 years and more than $100 million to really get this product to ramp up. Um, but now, as I mentioned earlier, Saitam oscillators are better than quartz in every way. Quality and reliability. So quartz kind of has a tendency, if you, if you drop it, they can crack. And they would have typical defect density. You know, about 200 parts per million would be defective when, when they would ship uh, a big shipment of these quartz parts. Saitam is like less than five parts per million. Frequency stability over time is incredibly good. Temperature and noise performance is good. And the size and cost. So we make them on 8-inch wafers. And there's more than 100,000 devices on an 8-inch wafer. And we get 97% yield just on a routine basis. There were a lot of MEMS competitors that came up. Um, when they saw that Saitime was starting to be successful, they've all gone away. And the reason is because our oscillator is made with single crystal silicon. Every other competitor had a polycrystalline material that they were trying to make an oscillator out of. And those polycrystals, you know, they, they, they move a little bit. There might be one atom that moves over here and another one atom that moves over here. And so they would fatigue. And if you're trying to build a kind of stable oscillator, you can't have one atom even moving around. So they currently ship about 25 million units per month. Had revenues of 85 million last year. And I think this is significant that Apple is the biggest customer. So they buy 45% of all the products that, that uh, Saitime ships. They were acquired by a Japanese company in, in 2014 for 200 million. Um, and I went to the VCs when they were about to sell the company. And I said, you're selling it too cheap. Don't sell it. Don't sell it now. We're just getting into Apple. But they sold it anyway. And um, so just last month, the company, uh, so Megachips is going to spin them out into a public company. So they're going to do an IPO in the next few months. And they'll probably be a billion dollar IPO when they do the IPO. So again, going forward in time, gas sensors and humidity. I won't get into this too much. Um, but these were the first kind of mass-produced chemical sensors for mobile devices, VOCs. Um, the goal is to have every cell phone monitoring, or the ultimate goal is to have every cell phone monitoring the environment, collect that into a network. The problem is these, tend, these devices tend to drift over time. So my own feeling is I think gas sensors and are, are, are still early. You still haven't come up with an ideal gas sensor that's stable, that's reproducible, that's low cost, that's going to get you to a really good uh, high volume uh, gas sensor technology. And I, I think it's still to come. So maybe that will be invented at the University of Michigan. And there's a growing need for these kind of sensors. I mean, even in just in HVAC systems, people want CO2 sensors for detecting occupancy. So there's so if you know that there's 100 people in this room, you, ne you need more air in there because they're going to be generating more CO2. So there's a l lot of u uh, use for these. And, and actually, companies like Nest are looking for uh, good CO2 sensors, for example. Another kind of interesting technology, which uh, 
isn't got a lot of press yet, but it's variable capacitor arrays. So the first companies doing this were Cavendish Kinetics and Weisbry. Here's the Weisbry. Each of these modules here is a, uh, is a MEMS beam, which gets electrostatically pulled down, and that changes the capacitance, right? So, so you, can, you can change the capacitance of this structure, and it's, I'll, I'll go to the application in a minute. Here's the Cavendish Kinetics chip, and you can see one of these layers is the variable capacitor that gets attracted down and changes the capacitance. So Weisbry was briefly on the market in 2011, maybe more seriously in 2014, but they haven't really totally transitioned, totally taken over the market yet. There's still problems with reliability and stiction. But Weisbry was acquired in 2015 by AAC, a Chinese company, and Cavendish Kinetics was acquired by Corvo just two months ago for supposedly, somebody told me, $400 million. So finally, it looks like this technology is going to take off. And here's the reason why this is important. You know, today's cell phones transmit and receive over many, many bands, maybe as many 20 bands, depending on what, what you're doing. And if you have, sorry, go back. If you have a wide ba band antenna, uh, the wide band forces you to have fairly low efficiency. But if you can have a, a, a narrow band antenna, uh, you can get much higher efficiency. And then if you can tune that antenna by changing the capacitance, you can tune over a fairly large band with a much higher efficiency. So that's kind of one of the reasons for that this device is really important and could have a big market. Optics is another area where uh, MEMS is starting to have an impact. Um, a company called Polite was founded in 2012. They have a, uh, a piezoelectric or a polymer layer, which is uh, top is sandwiched between a, uh, a glass plate with a piezo film on it. When the piezo film is warped, it bends this plate and basically changes the, the 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 curvature of the polymer and thereby changes the focus of the lens. So they they were founded, as I said, in two thousand founded in two thousand and five. They're still not in high volume production, but they did an IPO in, 19, in 2018 on the New York, uh, the Norwegian Stock Exchange. I think it's a little bit of a scam because they still don't have any production. But I, I really do believe that there's a, a, a huge opportunity to apply MEMS to some of these optical problems, especially cameras in cell phones. Force sensing, this is a company, Next Input, Founded in 2014, which, if you can, if you can add force, you know, right now you touch your phone and you move, you can do X Y detection of where your finger is. But if you could force, if you could press at each point, it would give you sort of an added degree of flexibility and a more of a human type interface. So that's what Next Input is trying to do. They have little force sensors, these little red dots, which they're trying to apply to phones. And so if you apply them in the four corners of the screen. And now you can actually detect where your finger is. You don't need the touch screen. And when you press down, you can detect whether you press. So yes, I'm going to press this button. I'm going to press that button. So um, they were founded in 2012. CEO is an experienced semiconductor executive. And they raised 29 million so far. They're, they're shipping relatively low volumes today. By that, I mean maybe uh, half a million a month or something like that. Um, and the two technical founders left the company in 2017 are doing another company. But I think this is an upcoming, exciting new technology. Um, a MEMS Ultrasonics. Um, this is a chip size ultrasonic tra uh, re transducer receiver in a small package. It's the size of a microphone. So if you know what a microphone looks like, it looks pretty much like this. It's got a little hole where the ultrasonic uh, pulse comes out, and then when it comes back, it's detected by the same transducer. Um, they're getting huge traction with drones, robots, VR and AR, and this is what it looks like. So they actually, they have these transducers in the goggles and in here, and these all communicate with each other ultrasonically, and they can determine where your hands are relative to your goggles very, very accurately. And uh, they were acquired by TDK last year. 
And actually, I was an investor in, in Chirp and advisor to them, and this was a pretty successful acquisition. So I'm going to talk, start, starting to get into the future a little bit, some big potential new markets, I think. One of them is MEM speakers. They're not on the market yet, but there are a couple of places that are looking at them. It's a huge problem, as you can imagine. You would need to move a lot of air you know, to make a, an efficient speaker. Um, but there's a number of companies trying to do that. Audio Pixels in Australia, they use electrostatic actuators. U Sound in Australia has 30 people. They use piezoelectric actuators. There's a company, Tiki Audio in Silicon Valley in the stealth mode, which seems to use kind of a thermal actuator technology. And there's an Israeli company called Sonic Edge, which I don't know what they do yet. Or I can't really say what they do yet. But it's going to be interesting to see how these come to the market. They're kind of the next high volume MEMS application. And is speakers going to be our next high volume application? Switches. Um, I built the first MEMS mechanical switches 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. This is kind of what it looks like. It's kind of a very clumsy looking device right now. Um, and companies have been trying to commercialize devices during the 40 years since then, and nobody's been successful. They've had low lifetimes have been the primary problem. But there's been some recent success stories in the last few years. Um, GE spun off a company after 10 years of research at the GE Research. Um, they went to their aero people who are building jet engines and saying, what's the best metallurgy you know, we can build to make a MEMS switch for reliability and long, long lifetime? And the, these GE aerospace engineers helped them out. So now they've spun off a company. And actually, some of their first switches are in, inside GE uh, medical instruments, MRI machines. Um, so they're, they're, they're starting to take off. And IMT, which is a MEMS foundry in Santa Barbara, has sampled some high performance devices. So maybe we're finally close to commercialization on MEMS switches after 40 years or so. So I'm just going to end the talk with a few um, speculations and, and discussions about med tech and biotech applications. This is kind of my favorite area because my most successful company was Cepheid was really a, a med tech device. So I sort of look on diagnostics as there's diagnostic chemistries and there's diagnostic instruments. So on the diagnostic instrument side, you know, there's going to be continued miniaturization of every type of instrument. I mean, that's sort of an ongoing thing, which we just take for granted. Gas chromatograph is sort of a part of that. But I think ultrasound is going to be one of the first big examples, I think, that's going to have a big impact on, on medicine. And this is uh, one of my partners at NovaSensor, Janusz Bryzik, has this company called Echo, where here's the transducer. So this has a one-inch silicon chip with 4,000 transducers over it, piezoelectric transducers, and of course all the CMOS underneath that. And um, they scan over, over your body and get these images. And, and all the, the, uh, most of the uh, uh, processing is done in the, in the iPad or in the phone. So this is the whole trans, this replaces these big things on a cart, you know, which you reel around in the hospital, which has all the ultrasonics on it. So this is going to replace that. And I think this is a, a very interesting product. In terms of diagnostic chemistries, I sort of look at this as three generations. The first generation of diagnostic chemistries was somebody in a lab who was pipetting things back and forth. And, you know, and then they had a bin for throwing things in, a five-gallon bucket for throwing pipettes in and reagents in. And, um, that was for many years. Then people automated robots to people. Sort of generation two was disposable cartridges. And that was really what Cepheid does. So you have a cartridge. All the reagents are inside. You put the sample in there, put that in the machine. It processes the sample. I think generation three, it's starting to come online. It's totally disposable reagent test systems integrated with CMOS and MEMS and microfluidics. So you'll just test for something, and then you throw the whole thing in the cartridge, and there's no instrument. The instrument is the disposable cartridge. There's a little bit of history there already. A company called Metrica developed uh, this instrument, uh, uh, which was sold to Bayer in 2000, and is, is still sold by Bayer, actually, which is an HbA1c test. So it just 
sits around, and, and typically a diabetic will do this test once a quarter. So they'll just take this little instrument, put a blood here, and it measures your HbA1c, and then you throw it away. It's all optics-based. Um, there's now new generations of such disposable things which are starting to come this to a whole new level. ZipDX is, is one of the companies. They use a silicon, single silicon integrated circuit MEM sensing chip. And again, it's optics based. And this is kind of what the whole system looks like. Here's the chip. So it has a transmitter for transmitting, for analyzing, transmitting the data, digital processing section, encryption, they're all just cartoonish. But the sensor is in the middle and the sensor is connected with various microfluidic components, injection plastic molded components. Up in here, there's a little display right here. And again, it's very simple, very low cost, um, and it's completely disposable. Um, their first test is for troponin, which is a heart attack indicator. So right now, you want to measure troponin if somebody has a heart attack, but this is a big machine to measure troponin. So an uh, emergency vehicle can't measure troponin when they see somebody, you know, somebody's fallen down, they collapse, they don't know whether they have a heart attack or not. If you had this disposable instrument, you could carry this in the emergency vehicle, do the test right there on the spot, and tell the hospital as you're driving there, this patient had a heart attack. So I think this, I think this is really going to catch on these totally disposable medical diagnostic instruments. So talk about microfluidics a little bit, its impact on biotech. It's huge. It's, it's all over uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Micro droplet manipulation. So they're building these incredibly complicated systems, fluidic systems. This has an aqueous sheath. So this is all flowing you know, to the right. And they have an aqueous sheath. They have uh, oil droplets. Inside those oil droplets, they have an aqueous core. And inside that aqueous core is a cell. And then they merge different aqueous cores with that cell. And they can, as they go down you know, over this path, as, as it's moving rapidly down that path, they can do chemical reactions, monitor the reactions on the individual cells as they're moving along these fluidic paths. And they're just doing amazing things. Um, here's some of the companies which have been started to do this. Um, uh, Quantalife, this pointer isn't working. Anyway, 10x Genomics is one of the kind of the strongest ones and just has a billion dollar market cap now. They're only about four years old. Uh, Mission Bio has a multi hundred million dollar market cap. And this is just revolutionizing how um, cell manipulation and, and um, uh, cell analysis being, is being done in the biotech industry. Oh, by the way, there's 240 other companies. So um, let's talk about implantables and injectables for a little bit. Pacemakers have been around for a long time. Cochlear implants have been around for a long time. They've been hugely impacted by work done at Michigan also. And various nerve stimulators have been around for a long time. All very, very successful products. So what's next? Uh, there's a lot of things that are next. Implantable blood pressure sensors have taken off in recent years, you know, five to ten years. Um, ISIS, is, which is the University of Michigan spin-off, has such devices as well as CardioMEMS. There's the ISIS device, CardioMEMS device. They're for different applications or implanting in different areas of the body. They're, they're, uh, induct or they're resonant circuit-based devices, so there's an LC circuit and you measure the that frequency, uh, that resonant frequency, and that tells you the pressure. Other devices, in vivo chemical sensing, I'll talk about that, glaucoma pressure sensors, which has also been impacted by Michigan, retinal implants, implantable drug delivery systems, ingestible monitoring pills. So there's a lot of things that are injectable and implantable that people are working on. The last three slides I'm going to talk about um, are going to touch on these three areas. Profusa was one of my companies founded, it was actually founded in 2009, does continuous glucose monitoring. So they make a little implant, that little blue bar that you inject under the skin, about three millimeters under the surface of the skin, and you have an optical patch that is monitoring the fluorescence of that little piece of plastic. 
And this is what the plastic looks like. You know, this pointer is not working right now. This is about half a millimeter in diameter. And it's made out of hydrogel plastic, which has all kinds of pores throughout the whole structure. And that makes the modulus of this piece of plastic almost the same as tissue. So you don't get any re immune response. Even if you're moving around, you have micro motion in the muscles and things. The other thing is these are 60 micron diameter little bubbles and little voids. And actually capillaries grow into those. So actually this thing becomes integrated with the tissue. So you cut it open and it's all the capillaries are growing in. It's just totally integrates with the tissue. No immune response whatsoever. And now inside this covalently bonded to this plastic are the receptors that latch onto um, glucose or any other molecule you design it for and changes the fluorescence. And so you have this optical reader which measures the fluorescence and now you can, uh, you can determine the concentration of these chemicals. So it's a totally passive device. And the idea is you want to close the loop between people already have insulin pumps, but right now they're, they're totally open loop. So if you have a sensor that you can use to close the loop, it's going to be huge for diabetics. And um, so this company, Fusa, has gotten cumulatively over the last uh, about eight years, $25 million from NIH and DARPA to do this work. And that's the founding, the founding team. So this lady, he, so the, Natalie invented it. And Soya is the rocket scientist chemist who invent, invented the chemistry for these uh, detection molecules. Ocular pressure monitoring, again, this has been, a lot of this has done, been done in Michigan. This is uh, InjectSense, this company. They make a little silicon MEMS device. This is, I think this is a grain of rice. So with a needle, into the inner wall of the eye, and actually telemeters out data about what the pressure is. So it's not a passive device, it's an active device that actively telemeters pressure out. And then of course that's read by some glasses. And one of my last devices, which is really my favorite, I always end talks with this, is a retinal prosthesis. Second site was founded in uh, 1998. Uh, first clinical trials, they did six patients. It was FDA approved for limited trials in 2013. And this is kind of what the external device looks like. It's uh, a transceiver here, a transceiver here which communicates with the implant in the eye. And there's a camera here which is looking out. And so a blind person wears this. Uh, and it's approved, it's approved for the current efficacy is relatively low because the chip only has 60 electrodes, but this is what it looks like. They implant this 60 electrodes on the retina with a little wireless electronics case which communicates with the glasses out here. And these patients can see sort of vague outlines of what's in front of them. Is there a door frame? Is there a table in front of them? And actually, even when these patients in 2002 had these first devices, um, they, the FDA required them to be taken out, and the patients were like, no, 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 you know, we don't want them taken out, we love them. So this is really, uh, I mean, MEMS is like solving blindness in people, and the patients love it. Uh, and I, I look at this 60 electrodes now, but this is only the beginning. There's other companies with similar products. There's a French company, a German company, an Australian company. This is going to, who's that guy on Star Trek that wears that? That thing over his eyes, this is going to replace that. It's great technology. So what's the next big impact on MEMS? Um, there's incredible structures being made with 3D printers. Submicron resolution. I mean, I think that this is just mind-blowing stuff. This is a 10 micron bar. And they're building cages for cells. I mean, this is phenomenal stuff. I think there are a lot of applications on a horizon, cell scaffolds for microbiology, microfluidics, micromachines, photonic crystals, additive manufacturing. I don't know how, these, how this technology is going to impact microfluidics and biotech and optics and implantable technologies, but I think it's going to have a phenomenal impact. So 
being an enthusiastic MEMS researcher for 45 years, you know, what do I think the future of MEMS is? Um, I think the big difference between now and, and, you know, even 20 years ago is there's a successful high volume products. They create infrastructure, design expertise, foundry capabilities, virtually every integrated circuit wafer fab makes MEMS devices. Packaging and test capabilities. So all this infrastructure for building MEMS is in place and for, for designing and building MEMS. Also, you need, you need similar kind of infrastructure in the marketplace. So I said earlier, MEMS used to be a four-letter word. That was literally true. We would go to foundries and have our MEMS made, and they'd say, God, go away, go away. But now, actually, the marketplace has confidence. You know, there's, there's probably 1,000 MEMS devices in this room. Um, and so these questions that people would ask, can you, can you really mass produce a MEMS oscillator with parts per billion accuracy over temperature, which only costs 10 cents? The answer is, yeah, we do it. We've shipped one and a half billion. So in the 70s and 90s, as I mentioned, MEMS was a four letter word. That's no more, no more the case. All that infrastructure is in place. And bio MEMS, medical MEMS, health MEMS is really just now getting started it's in the very early stages. New business MEMS opportunities are all around us. And I think the future of MEMS is bright and growing. Still to be involved in the MEMS area. So thank you all for listening. I appreciate it.